What's up, everybody? It is Izzy, back again with another Q&A. This one's really short today. That wasn't intentional. I just didn't get a lot of questions. So with that said, let's get to the first one. Is it harmful to take a cat nap if you already get enough sleep at night? Well, harmful is a big, big stretch, but uh, it can disrupt your sleeping patterns. So if you sleep too late in the day, like past the midway point of your normal waking hours, or if you sleep too long, like you tr get into true like REM sleep, like a, a 90 minute kind of nap situation, those can both impact sleep. So if you keep it in the first half of the day and 30 minutes and under, you should be fine. Dante Trudell says that wide grip stretches the lats more and Coach Kaz says that a narrow grip stretches the lats more. Who is correct? Who cares? It doesn't even matter. Humeral elevation is what stretches the lats, which you can get with either a wide grip or a narrow grip. It tends to be that most people will be able to get a higher degree of humeral elevation with a narrower grip. But again, it doesn't matter because a stretch is a stretch. So this is one, like one of those things where like, you know, if you just train, you know that whether you use a wide grip or a narrow grip, you can get a big stretch. There's absolutely no need to obsess over these completely pointless minor details. Shout out to Trevor for the suggestion on where to get these little ball attachments. Really helps my elbow pain on these movements. Why is sleep affected at the end of a fat loss phase? Um, there's not really going to be like a neat little answer to this question. You know, it's not like, why are plants green? Well, because of the chlorophyll. Uh, no, when, when you are dieting, there is a variety of fatigue and stress factors that continue to build up. These fatigue and stress factors cause changes on the hormonal levels and the accumulation of all of these things happening and you getting leaner and leaner and leaner represents a larger and larger stress and usually larger and larger amounts of fatigue are building alongside of it. And similar to how enough training stress can disrupt sleep, when enough physiological stress builds up, it will have a negative overall impact on your ability to fall asleep, to maintain sleep, and you'll see this exact same thing happen to people who are going through life stress as well. You can't really pin it down to one little neat sentence. Are Captain of Crush Grippers good for forearm hypertrophy? I know I'm gonna like get a lot of people pissed by saying this, but I think they suck. I think most grip stuff sucks for forearm hypertrophy. And the reason for that is grip stuff is highly dependent on readiness. It's not incrementally adjustable. So Captain of Crush, Captain of Crush Grippers come in anywhere from like 20 to 40 pound increments. Um, performance is super inconsistent. You can't do a ton of volume on it or it wrecks your grip. It's just as likely to be limited by your fingers as the wrist flexors and wrist extensors. So overall, I mean, if you want to get good at crushing grip strength, that's what they're for. If you want to grow your forearms, work on things like reverse curls and wrist flexion and wrist extension with things like wrist curls and reverse wrist curls, not grip stuff. Is it normal to need 10 hours of sleep after a long day of work? I sometimes feel sleepy and I go to sleep. Yeah, man, that's pretty normal to be tired after a long day of work. Uh, the av average sleep needs vary between like six to 12 hours a night. Women tend to need a little bit more sleep than men. Younger people tend to need a little bit more sleep than older people, but there is of course individual variation. You know, some people just don't need as much as others. Second question on this slide. Do you ever notice your dogs acting differently towards you when you are on 19 nores? No. I mean, the mythology of trend though is hilarious. Like, is there anything trend can't do at this point? I've even heard people claim that trend changes your sexuality. No, my dogs don't smell the trend on my blood. <laughs> is golfer's elbow just an overuse slash recovery thing? So the way to think about tendonitis in general, the model that I use to think about it is it's gonna be dysfunction times volume equals like the end result. So for example, if you have very minimal dysfunction in a joint or you've picked really movements that fit your structure very well, you'll be able to do a lot more volume before tendonitis becomes a problem. But if you've picked, for example, a movement that's terrible for your structure and irritates you even at light weights, and now you're pouring tons of volume in, into that movement, you'll have really bad tendonitis really fast. So it isn't as simple as saying it's always just an overuse thing as you might want to discuss with a PT, for example, what problems you have specifically in terms of mobility restrictions that could lead to that. Are there any back exercises besides pullover variations that minimize elbow involvement? I'd bet a hundred bucks you're the same guy that asked Trevor this question yesterday. And he already gave you a really good answer, which is to just cuff your upper arm and that way you can do pull down and row variations without actually having to transmit force through your elbow however if you're talking about back exercises that you can do without doing that for some reason there's really only two i can think of where you don't bend your elbow at all 
that would be various pullover variations and then the other one is going to be like the reverse pec deck so if you're not willing to get the cuff you're going to be pretty limited in terms of the options that you have for training your back if you just cannot transmit force through your elbow for whatever reason how would you design a hypertrophy program for someone who works nine to five and wants to include two runs a week what is this man like your exact personal situation are you just like asking me to design you a program for free i mean while you got me why not why stop there like do you need your fridge cleaned out your your lawn mowed maybe maybe i can clean out the attic for you too while i'm at it if you care about your runs don't put them on the same day as leg day and if you care about your leg days don't put runs the, the runs the day before leg day but other than that i would need way more information to give you a personal split man i have sleep issues after the same training session every week the others are fine should i reduce the volume you're doing that thing where the answer to your question is in the question so yes i mean you already figured it out you already nailed it the only other thing you could consider doing is reducing the intensity of the session or if you use pre-workout with caffeine drop that or at least reduce it are hgh analogs and secretagogues worth it for injury recovery and injury prevention there's going to be absolutely zero research on that zero it would be completely speculative speculative based on the fact that hgh secretagogues and the analogs would work similarly to a, a steady elevated bloodstream level of HGH, which I don't think would be the case. So if you, if you're, if, if this is because my TRT clinic can get it for me legally, well, there's plenty of TRT clinics that can get you HGH legally. There's even more TRT clinics that can get you BPC 157 or TB 500 legally as well. So if the concern is legality, there's much better options than using CJC or epimoralin in an experimental way to help recover from or prevent injuries. There's stuff that's actually made for that this question is essentially what is the optimal way to train lower lats and it's really a simple answer lat rows pretty much in the end okay lat rows there you go now the real answer to this question which is more interesting and more applicable to so many of you out there you don't have weak lower lats she fucking cries man you don't you don't and i would have gotten so pissed if someone talked to me this way when i was your age which is funny um for hypocritical reasons, but, 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 you're just impatient. You're just, you've been training a few years. You don't have weak anything. You're not, you're like not even that close to your genetic potential yet to know whether or not you even have weak body parts. You haven't even filled out your strong body parts. You don't have weak lower lats. You don't need to do a bunch of separate exercises that target the lower lats. Row 315 for strict reps first, try stuff like that. Is the wrist roller a good exercise for forearm hypertrophy? Yes, because again, what, what did I say? The most important things for forearm hypertrophy, in my opinion, are going to be flexion and, ex uh, fle flexion and extension of the wrist. And with this <clears throat> device, you can actually train both so long as you go in both directions. The only caveat that I will give here is that this thing does introduce grip as a potential limiting factor, whereas if you're doing wrist curls or reverse wrist curls with a bar or a dumbbell, you can always strap into that. And that way, you know, your fingers never become a limiting factor. However, you know, there is some benefit to training your grip for forearm size anyway. It's not huge, but this will cover that base as well. So overall, it's, a, it's definitely an exercise that you can use if it gives you a good SFR. All right, everybody, you know the drill. If you like the video, like the video. Subscribe if you haven't already. Leave any questions or comments below. And enjoy this interesting photo of me with a fro during COVID. <laughs> Have a good one.